touch me. The Kelly Lane case is like no other. A murder mystery. She's a murderer. The golden girl who ended up a baby killer. There's no way she'd kill a baby. Baby Tegan was never seen again. Nothing was found. Not anything. It doesn't matter. May told more than 95 lies. She hadn't told a single solitary person in her life. There is only really one person who can tell what happened, and that's Kelly Lowe. I'm okay, how are you? Yeah, good, good, good. Where I want to take you today is a, it's quite, it's a very powerful and a distressing point in time for you. I, yep. I, I want to take you to the day of the verdict. Yep. Everybody kept saying to me, the case has gone well, the trial's gone well. Random barristers and solicitors were coming into the court and telling me, you'll be okay, you're not going. We've never seen a trial unfold like this. And, um, you know, I had the tingling. I remember standing at the window in the room upstairs, looking out the window, and I could hear the jury downstairs, and I was just petrified. Do you remember the last, uh, that morning at home? Well, it was your last morning at home? Yeah, yeah. Well, did I you, didn't, did you I say didn't do goodbyes? anything different to any other mornings because I, I didn't know it was going to be my last. So I literally left the washing up in the sink. I got my daughter ready for school. I kissed her goodbye and, and said, see you this afternoon. And then I, I never went home. I, I, don't, I don't know that I could have parted from her. I don't, I don't know that I could have said goodbye to her. <laughs> it hurts as much today as it did then. Had no idea she was, she was going down. In her mind, no idea. Kelly, Kelly, Kelly. It's really quite rare for people to be convicted of murder where there's nobody. And the law is to the effect that be very careful before you go convicting people where there's nobody, because there is always a possibility that the person you're convicting uh, is innocent. So the inquest finishes in 2006, and by then, Tegan would be 10 years old. So the case is referred to the Homicide Squad, and this is the officer who takes over. OK. So this is, this is Sharon Rhodes, Detective Sharon Rhodes, mm -hmm. and she has to reinvestigate the whole brief. So Sharon is absolutely key because she is the one that brought Kelly Lane to trial. What we know is that Sharon Rhodes has left the police force. She's no longer serving. So we're going to see her at her place um, to see if she will speak to us. She said when she was contacted by us, how did you find me? And was very shocked. And there was a silence on the phone. She's worked very hard, I think, to become anonymous and not be found. This is the first time you've ever well, sat down and spoken to, to people of, about this outside? Absolutely. Mm. I didn't want to talk about it for a long time. It's taken me a long time to feel comfortable enough to be able to speak about this. There was a lot of pressure with this, more pressure than I'd ever felt with any other matter. You know, yes, I got a guilty verdict, Oh, my team and I got a guilty verdict. I, I would happily give all of that back to have not almost lost my mind. I 
wanted to find Tegan. I wanted to find her and put her to rest, because I think she'd be a tortured soul. This may be Tegan Lane's final resting place. Police are taking a closer look underneath a suburban home in Sydney's north to follow a new lead. It was about getting evidence to charge Kelly and, and put Kelly before the court. It's also about finding Tegan. Is that property connected to the father of the child? Uh, we don't know that. We don't know who the father is. At the time, her boyfriend, Duncan Gillies, lived in the home. Kelly went there so often because she was going out with Duncan Gillies and that was his house that I typed up the warrant with the belief that if Tegan was anywhere, that Kelly had taken her to Venus Street and disposed of her remains there. They're grid searching it. It's the only way we can ensure that we cover all of it. She wasn't under the house, she wasn't in the walls, she wasn't in the roof, she wasn't in the backyard. She wasn't anywhere on that property. I mean, they've already checked it. They already took the dogs in and there's nothing there. So no, that's right. why make a fanfare of digging it up? I remember one of the phone calls. Kelly made the comment on the day we did the dig at Gladesville and she said, they can dig the china for all I care. It's like, and, she, and I could hear the confidence in her voice. Yeah, they can dig the fucking china for all I care, fuck. <laughs> How do you account for that, that confidence? Well, there was no way we could find who the father was because there's no DNA. She had sufficiently muddied the waters with the Andrew Morris Norris line of inquiry. So they're just so excited that they might stumble across a sports star or a famous person's sex life and they want to, yeah. You know, I think they just get off on all the juicy. Just ridiculous. Yeah. We needed to identify the fathers of Kelly's children. And we needed to have a bank of DNA available that if we did find remains or if remains of Tegan were ever found, we could um, check them against our bank of DNA. How did they respond when they found out? Gutted, absolutely gutted. Who is Tegan's father? I think um, it's a question we'll never know unless we find Tegan and get her DNA. We tried. We really tried. I used every trick in the book. An undercover strategy, covert DNA samples, every resource that was available. There was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. And she didn't say, I killed Tegan? No. No, not at all. We didn't have anything. So we have this document here. The evidence does not establish a motive beyond reasonable doubt. Because we didn't have... that was It was a belief, it was my gut instinct. By November 2008, to be completely honest, we hadn't reached the, the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so we weren't in a position to charge uh, Kelly Lane at that point, so sought legal advice. So hadn't, hadn't, hadn't met the bar for murder? Hadn't met the standard of proof required. After, gosh, two years' investigation yes. with homicide? several years with Manly, a coronial mm. inquest. It still wasn't there. So we wanted, I wanted to know whether or not um, it would ever get there or were we wasting our time and should we um, stop the investigation? And that was why we then sent it to the DPP for legal advising. When this matter came to me, it was a, a large matter. This was an unusual case in that it was the possibility of a murder charge without a body. 
and that meant that the other circumstantial evidence had to be pretty compelling to justify bringing the proceedings. What was your own view? My own view was that there was a case of murder to be prosecuted. It raised all sorts of values. The, the relationship between a new mother and child, the idea of child killing, which is so abhorrent to the community generally, the nature of the accused and her conduct over a period of time, that made it important. That meant it, it got priority over other cases. Was she a risk to the community? <laughs> I mean, well, mother, I, I, motherhood is important I, I and the value of that, but... I don't think Kelly Lane was a risk to the community in that she would go around killing other people's babies. Um, she seemed to be a, a, a bit of a risk to the virile young male portion of the community. <laughs> But that's, that's not grounds for putting her in prison, of course. <laughs> she came here and saw us at home. It was in the evening. We were entertaining some people. We had to ask them to leave, and um, that's when she told us. What'd she say? She just said straight out. I've been charged with the murder of, of a baby. I mean, I was so shocked. Was there ever a moment, Rob, where you sat down with Kelly and just asked her point blank? You know, could you have done something? Did you do anything? Oh, of course I did, yeah. She just said, Dad, you know, it's me, basically. <clears throat> a Sydney woman has been charged with murdering her baby daughter, who's been missing and presumed dead for 13 years. This is big. Kelly and her family are devastated by these charges and will strenuously defend them. And I cried. I just sat there and cried and just sort of like a relief. Tears of joy in terms of like something, you know, done for Tegan, finally. The infant was last seen alive when she was just two days old in September 1996 as her mother took her from Auburn Hospital. My friend rang me and said, Kelly Lane's on the front page of the paper. And I went, really? Picked up the paper and went, oh my God. Kelly maintains her innocence and will continue as she has done in the past to assist in the search of Tegan, whom she believes to be alive, well and happy. How can this be someone we know? Kelly, what do you have to say to the charges? Please don't touch me. Have we all been hoodwinked as to who this person is? Like, it doesn't make sense to me. Do you think Kelly Lane harmed that child, Tegan? No way. No way. There's no way she'd kill a a baby that she would have held in her arms at some stage and looked into its eyes, you know? No way. What sort of prosecutor did you need to handle this matter and handle it successfully? This was a case that called for a very experienced prosecutor someone in the top echelon of prosecutors. For more than two decades, Crown Prosecutor Mark Tedeschi has been the star performer at the most infamous murder trials in the country, and the prosecutor defence lawyers love to hate. It must be this relieved. must be one of the biggest wins you've had of your career, Mr Tedeschi. Sorry, I can't comment. Mark is formidable in court, the number one top prosecutor in the state of New South Wales. He's a formidable opponent, um, and he plays to win. Mark Tedeschi is sometimes, or has sometimes in his career, been a controversial prosecutor. The career of Australia's highest flying prosecutor is under attack after a scathing judgment from the New South Wales Appeal Court. I'm enormously relieved we've finally been exonerated. Court of Criminal Appeal accused Mr Tedeschi of unfairness 
In fact, he's the only prosecutor in the state who's ever faced a legal tribunal over allegations of professional misconduct. To date, though, not one complaint has ever stuck. Uh, interview with uh, Mark Tedeschi. Wow, OK. It's the cruise already in here. Good luck. <laughs> Perhaps before we begin, the correct pronunciation of my name, Mark Tedeschi. I was the lead prosecutor in the trial of Kelly Lane. It was entirely a circumstantial case. We had to prove death without a body. We had to prove that whatever happened to baby Tegan, that she was deliberately murdered by Kelly Lane. There's no evidence of a death, no evidence of a body, no evidence um, of a homicide. There's no witnesses, there's no confession. It became very obvious to me that in order to conduct the case, it would be necessary to lead evidence about the other pregnancies that Kelly Lane had had, and in particular, the other two births which she had had in secret. To get evidence admitted into a trial that has nothing directly relevant to the case in question. This was incredibly damaging for Kelly because the prosecution had no case. The only case they could make was one that they constructed around the, the lies that Kelly had told on the adoption papers. That opened the door to her previous sexual history, all of the previous pregnancies, and with the associated lies that she told when she wanted to hide what was happening to her from her family and friends. And the net effect of that was that um, this built Kelly up as this progressive liar. My name is Anthony Wheely, QC, and I was the presiding judge in the trial of Kelly Lane. Yes, Mr. Crown. How smart was it for the prosecution to attach those perjury charges to murder charge? You would say that that's a smart move from a forensic point of view, where you've got a, charges that, on the face of it, bear no relationship to the principal charge you would normally say to the defence counsel, well, why, uh, why don't you want to get these off? What have, what have they got to do with the murder charge? I awaited an application from the defence to strike those perjury counts from the indictment and it didn't come. I asked the counsel bluntly, uh, would you like to make an application to the court? You asked the defence counsel, would you like to strike the perjury charge? Yes, charges? I did. Mm, yes. Uh, you could say I dropped the hint. But it never happened. What did your defence team tell you about whether to sever those perjury charges or they, not? They didn't advise me to sev sever them. Um, from memory, the quote was, warts and all, we're going to go for all of it. We have nothing to hide, so we're going to put it all in. She was now exposed to a serious attack on her credibility that wouldn't otherwise have been available. What people forget is Kelly was very young. These are lies that a young, scared person might easily make. What was your defence team's strategy? Well, it was that, that I was innocent. Um, they said, you don't have to justify yourself. Um, you don't have to put up a defence. They're the rules of the court. There are so many questions for the defence, you know. What was their tactic at the trial? What was she instructing them? What, what was she listened to? And we won't know. We won't be able to find out, probably, unless they speak to us. So her defence solicitor is Ben Archbold. He represented Kelly at the trial. What do we know about Ben Archibald? We What's know... his career path, his he, experience? We know he's a former Victorian police officer. He was a contestant on Big Brother several years ago. The reality show. The reality show. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, Ben. Hello? Hello. Ben Archibald? Hello? Yeah, I'm just hanging on a minute. I've got a new phone now. 
You there, ABC? And Ben, we had a chat late last year. You said that, yes, you'll meet with me. You said that, and your exact words were, you'd do anything to help your former client, Kelly. We're coming to you as, as in your role as her solicitor, her defence solicitor at the trial, because there's information that we've obtained that we really need to discuss with you. He's just hung up on me. Ben Archibald was assisted by Catherine Laurie. Catherine Laurie. Oh, hi, Catherine. It's uh, Caro Meldron Hannah here. How are you? From ABC. She said, I don't want to proceed. They were instructing Keith Chappell, barrister, who ran the case. As I understand it, Keith Chappell, that he only had around three weeks to get on top of the brief before pre-trial began. I think this is a particular instance where uh, three weeks doesn't sound like enough to me. Why not enough? Explain well, that. Well, because there's a mountain of material. I, I mean, I, and, and the devil was in the detail. So should we call Chapel now? Oh, I'm Keith Chappell. I can't take a call at the moment. Thanks, Keith. Bye. Oh, he's out until lunch. OK. It's just re-diverting, re-diverting. No one's picking up. Thank you, bye. Thanks, bye. Thanks, bye. <sighs> All three aren't talking to us. By the time the trial was beginning, how complete and rigorous was that police investigation and all those searches? Oh, look, the, the vast bulk of the evidence had been completed well prior to the trial. 99.9% .9 of it had been done prior to the trial. He's misinformed. That's not correct. No, things were not 99.9% .9 ready. Not at all. So you were ready, ready to go to trial? Absolutely. Did he say that? You'd have to pick me up off the floor. No, I'm, I, no, we weren't ready. There was births, deaths and marriages, Department of Immigration searches. It was, you know, searching all the possible places where there could be a record of Tegan Lane. It was folders, all of that. The whole thing was full. That was all the searches. Um, and that was just the school searches. So it was massive. It was, it was mammoth. What stage should the police investigation have been at by the time should the trial? Should be completed. Began? Should be completed. It should have been completed before this trial began. Was and it? No. This was a case that was being prepared on the run. There's no doubt about that. Thirty-five-year-old Kelly Lane faces the Supreme Court. When senior counsel for the Crown, Mark Tedeschi, uh, began his opening, it was a very forceful opening. 14 jurors have been impanelled for the trial, which is expected to hear at least three months of evidence. Mr Tedeschi's opening, he would talk about the birth of the first child, and then he would point to the jury, and he would say, lie. Then he would move to the next fact, then we'd hold up his hand and say, lie. And he would say that quite a few times. Powerful weapon. We advanced in the opening address some suggestions as to why she did it, but not as to how or where she did it, because that was unknown. Can a prosecutor or should a prosecutor introduce their own theories in an opening address when they don't have evidence to back it up? A prosecutor may only base what is said on the evidence. Cannot speculate about other things cannot introduce personal theories about what might have happened. That's contrary to the principles of the trial. 
First, a jury has heard startling allegations. Stunning allegations have been made on day two of the Kelly Lane murder trial. It's alleged Lane may have killed and dumped her baby Tegan's body at the Homebush Olympic site. There was no evidence to support that assertion at all. I was shocked, shocked and, and worried about what it was going to mean for us. Because if it's mentioned in an opening address, there has to be evidence then put to the jury for it, otherwise you've misled the jury. Uh, there was no evidence of it. And uh, one thing in a criminal trial is quite serious, you know, if you're going to talk about the disposal of a body, uh, you've got to have some evidence of it. <laughs> you have to, really. <laughs> Where did the theory of the Olympic Park disposal come from? I... I don't want to answer that because that was withdrawn and it's therefore not on the record. Olympic Park theory. That's a good one. The Olympic Park theory. Yeah, come the opening day of the trial. So Mark does the opening address and there you go. This is my theory that I said to him weeks ago. So was that any of that story, was that um, based on fact and evidence or was it a theory of yours? A theory of mine? Yeah, it was a theory. Was it a theory without evidence? It was ruled by the judge to be um, not appropriate, and it was withdrawn by the Crown. Do you regret making that? I don't wish to answer questions about it. The next morning, the Crown prosecutor withdrew that statement. He accepted there was no evidence to support it, and I asked Mr Chappell, Defence Counsel for Kelly Lane, whether he wanted me to discharge the jury because they'd heard this suggestion and he, he did not wish me to. She had the opportunity to have a retrial, to abort the trial at that stage. However, she was asked and she said, I want to get this done over with. This has been going on for years and she believed, and she believed that she was innocent and things would work out. So the Crown case was that with Tegan's birth, Kelly was due to go to a wedding of some friends on the 14th of September 1996 and she realised that she had to get out of the hospital by the morning of the 14th if she was going to make it to the wedding. Mr Tedeschi made powerful submissions about the motive, about Kelly not being able to cope with the birth of this child and it was pursued forcefully right throughout the trial. I gave her a bath and I fed her and we had a sleep. How did you leave? How did you leave the maternity ward? How did you walk out? Um, so, well, Andrew was with us by then. There was a lift at the end of the corridor and we just went down in the lift. When we went downstairs, it was like a foyer area and um, Mel and his mother stood up as we approached. It just was that feeling of, is this the right thing to do? You know, I looked at them and not to judge, but I didn't know them. And I did have that moment of maybe, maybe I could just take her. Maybe I could just, you know, do it myself, but just so painful. Where did you hand her over? Um, we were in that foyer area and we were there for probably 10 to 15 minutes, I think. The problem is it's not exactly clear when Kelly Lane left hospital. She says around lunch, but there's no surveillance, there's no CCTV, and the only piece of written evidence is the nurse's notes. These are the nurse's notes. Oh, yes. On that day. That helps. 2 p.m., 1400 hours, nursing, patient discharged home with baby. With baby. 
So that's, according to the nurse, two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, if that's the time frame, it's very tight. She's really got on a bike to get to this wedding and be a guest. If it's 2 p.m. at 1400 hours, Kelly Lane, or around then, mm -hmm. she left the hospital with Tegan. It gives her one hour to drive from Auburn Hospital, stopping off at Gladesville, getting to her parents' place by 3 p.m. That gives her a matter of minutes to kill and dispose of Tegan. Yes, that's right, which is ve very, very, it would be extremely difficult to do. Somehow, the clock was wound back from 2 p.m. being the accepted time of discharge at inquest to 12 noon at trial. You've really got to talk to the nurse. Midwife Anne-Marie Hanlon was there 14 years ago. The room was empty, the bed was empty, the baby cot was empty. There were no possessions in the room. Nurse Anne Hanlon said in her 2003 statement, I have no actual recollection of that patient. Mm. Kelly Lane and her child were discharged around 1400 hours, mm. being 2pm. Yes. In her 2008 statement five years later, she says, I'm now offering further information and goes on to vividly remember visiting Kelly Lane in her room, even which way Kelly Lane's feet were facing in her bed. Remarkable memory return. I'm now able to say that she left around 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. See, I, I do not understand how her memory of it changed. So were you concerned about Anne Hanlon's changes in memory? Of course. How did that happen? Only Anne Hanlon could answer that question. Perhaps her memories were jogged as a result of things she heard or saw or what was in the media. If she did leave at 12 noon, I think nursing staff should have recorded she left at 12 noon. I was the senior medical officer on duty at Auburn Hospital that particular day. So what time then do you think, according to these notes, going off these notes, Kelly Lane was discharged and left hospital? Within the hour after two. I was asked to see this baby. I reviewed the baby and gave the baby a clean bill of health. I just told the nurses, she's a healthy baby, I'm happy to let them go. I'm happy for a patient to be discharged. The notes indicate she'll be discharged in the proper manner. Kelly Lane left the hospital between 11 a.m. and midday on that day, which was a Saturday. The nurse's notes said around 1,400 hours. No, that was incorrect. The evidence, it was about 1,400 hours when, when they filled out the hospital notes, when they completed the hospital notes. The International Olympic Committee has awarded the year 2000 Games to Sydney. She was an absolutely dedicated player of water polo and hoped to represent Australia in the Olympics in 2000 when water polo was going to be an Olympic event for the first time. Lane didn't feel she could look after her baby because she wanted to represent Australia at the Sydney Olympics. She was driven to murder because a child would have ruined her chances of representing Australia at the 2000 Games. How ambitious was she? She was incredibly ambitious to represent Australia. It meant a tremendous amount to her. Did you ever hear Kelly Lane speak about wanting to go to the Olympics? No. Ever expressing a desire? No. Simple as that. No way breathing. <laughs> Kelly's water polo ambitions, you know, yes, there's a 2000 Olympics here, yes, it's the first time women's water polo is going to be in the Olympics. But if you want to go to the Olympics, you stop everything else. That's the only way you're going to get to that team. Did she stop everything and just focus on no, the No, absolutely not. 
she wouldn't have been at the pub on a Saturday night. Just, that's the athlete world. She knew that. So was Kelly Lane even in line to make the Olympics? No. At any stage? No. There are other things in life. Teaching was a really big thing for me. I really wanted to teach and water polo wasn't really on the radar anymore. I think if anything Kelly had a dream, it was to marry well in Manly and recreate the lifestyle that her family had given her. So that's where I think her real life goal would have been. White picket fence, stroll down the beach, have a swim in the morning, take your kids to Manly West, go to the rugby on a Sunday. Accused of running from hospital to murder her baby, and today Kelly Lane sprinted into court where her barrister told jurors of her innocence. They can't prove how, when, where, or even why Kelly Lane would murder her newborn child. They can't even prove that child is dead. It was an absolute schmozzle from the start, and it was so disorganised. We were being hit with brief at all different times of the night during the trial, new witness statements were coming in. They were still taking witness statements and it just, it was, it was an avalanche of paper. It couldn't ever keep up. Is it fair what's going on here for the defence and the defendant? No, absolutely not. So much material was being served on the defence um, during the trial and the defence were getting very upset about it, understandably so. The judge was getting very upset about it. We were continuing with the searches for Andrew Morris, Andrew Norris and Tegan, and those searches continued during the trial and the judge was uh, very frustrated that these searches were continuing. I said, I'm concerned about the defence being placed in a difficult position. Naturally, I'm concerned about that. That's also double speak for, come on, I don't want to see this occurring again. And you did just say before that if it happened again, if mm. this went on continued, yeah. mm. enough, that's true. Mm. And it would be the, mm. you'd have to abort that trial. Sure. Mm. If anything further of that kind happened, well, I think it didn't happen. That was about... Those remarks must have been enough to stop the Crown's external rush to get proof. It never went away. There was never any respite. There was never any stop to it. Something I need to understand, and this is back to the opening address, the prosecution's opening address. Mark Tedeschi told the court that the jury was going to hear from this man, Andrew Morris, and he said that this Andrew Morris had a single sexual encounter with Kelly Lane and that he doesn't have the baby, he doesn't have Tegan, so they could prove through this man that her story about Andrew Morris was a lie, but he was never ever called as a witness. What happened to Andrew Morris? What happened to Andrew Morris? Um, Andrew Morris um, didn't give evidence as a direct result of a deal but done between the prosecution and the defence. That was a tactical decision made by both counsel. I didn't see anything sinister in any of that at all. It happens quite frequently. That was the culmination of a tremendous amount of uh, discussion and negotiation between the parties. So, of course, I obviously can't discuss that because it's not on the record. What did the prosecution want from Andrew Morris? What did they want him to be? Well, they wanted him to say, I'm the Andrew Morris, I remember having sex with her, and he didn't have the baby. That was the important part because she asserts that she gave Tegan to Andrew Morris. <laughs> Standing with me here is Mr. Andrew Morris at the North Narrabeen Surf Life Saving Club. You've 
come over here and you've stopped in the sand here. Yep. Okay. Yep. And and then what's happened here once you once, once you've arrived? Well, we, yeah, we just uh, all made out, um, and uh, I do remember having sex uh, here, um, unprotected. I didn't have um, didn't have any protection. Never met him. Never seen him in my life. No, sorry, never, ever, ever met him. So you deny sleeping with Andrew Morris? 100%. Don't know him, never seen him. I did offer to, to walk her back um, to wherever she was going. She, she said, no, it's right. So I said, OK. OK, great. I'll do that. Thanks, Andrew. Um, he said he'd, he'd meet. Yeah, he's in Townsville. Tell me what happened. Um, I just got a, uh, a phone call um, from a, a detective. He's looking uh, at a homicide um, and just wondering if he could, if I could come in to uh, have a look at some photos. So this one you were shown. Yes. And then what did police say to you? Well, how, how do you know her? <laughs> I said, I don't know, I can't remember. She just looks familiar. So how did that person that sort of looks familiar to you, how did she then become the person that you'd slept with at the beach? With the information that I was being provided by the police, like, they told me that she grew up uh, in uh, the northern suburbs of Sydney. They told me that she was a, a groupie following all the surf club competitions. Made me think, well, oh, it must have been her. It must have been Kelly Lane. We had him ready to go. He was sitting in that witness room, ready to go. And then, uh, for reasons that I still don't fully understand, the decision was made not to put him on the stand, and he was sent home. Tedeschi came back and said, oh, that's it, you're done. You don't have to give evidence. Something like we've done a deal that you don't have to give evidence, but either does one of Kelly's witnesses. Wonder how important their story was then. I think they should have heard from Natalie McCauley in fairness. The jury should have heard all of the evidence, good, bad or otherwise, because that's what they do, that's their job. I won't ever forget that night, summer, 1995. At the time I was working at Royal Copenhagen in Manly Corso, which is across from the state. I was sober or may have had one drink and uh, Kelly was there and she was a bit full up and she talked about this guy she was having an affair with. And what was his name? Andrew. The Andrew is clear because that's my brother's name, so. Kelly told me about Andrew at the right time period that we're talking about. I've been clear from that from the start and the jury never heard from me. You couldn't have invented this memory to help your friend? No. Well, I worked for the United Nations as the Chief of Child Protection in the Philippines and I would never lie for a friend on such a serious issue. I am passionate about children's rights. I love children. Every day, my waking hour, I'm protecting kids. I'm not about to let my friend get off easy if she's hurt a child. What difference could your evidence have made if the jury heard from you? I've got two words for you. Reasonable doubt. What did the DPP want to do with Natalie McCauley? Neutralise her. because 
if she was going to be damaging to the prosecution in any way, they needed to neutralise any damage that she may have on us, on the prosecution. The deal was that um, Natalie wouldn't be called in exchange for Andrew Moas not being called. And Andrew's evidence would have been that he shagged Kelly on the beach. Can you say with confidence, can you say at all that it was Kelly Lane that you slept with at the caravan park? No. I suppose I was led down to believe that's who I slept with. It snowballed and just got bigger and bigger. I didn't feel like it, yeah. I couldn't turn back. Looking back on this now, considering the pressure, can you acknowledge the possibility that Andrew Morris was led or coached yes. to come up with yes. a memory. I can see that in hindsight, yes I can. I don't like admitting that, but yeah, I can see that. Do you have any idea why you weren't called as a witness? No. You were traded out in a witness swap. For who? a man called Andrew Morris. But he's not, he wasn't the Andrew. There is an Andrew and she had slept with him a number of times, not once, a number of times. And she told me that that night. And this is not a reflection on the different advocates at trial, but a part of the, the game playing that goes on during a trial process. I think there's an enormous lot that the public doesn't know about the game playing. If the jury didn't hear from everyone they should have, what does that make the trial? I think it, it, it's not fair. The jury needs to hear from everybody. I wish I stood up in the stand. I wish I told my side of the story. There's a lot more to me that the jury needed to know than what the prosecution gave them. She wouldn't participate in, in being um, forensically, psychologically, you know, assessed. She just completely said no to all of it. You have to look in this whole case in its whole totality to go, something is seriously wrong here with Kelly. What's the likelihood of Kelly Lane ever saying yes to being assessed by a mental health practitioner? Do you think she'd no, ever do? No, I don't think so. Because I don't think she could face what it would turn up. How's your fire? Good. I'm Ann Bust, a professor of psychiatry specialising in mothers and babies. I've assessed hundreds of women accused of abusing their child and over a dozen of murdering their infant. It sounds as if it's been quite a probing interviewing experience for Kelly. Hello. Hi. I'm very interested to hear what you have to say. There's a great deal of murkiness here. She's the hardest, most difficult case. She, she differs very much to the other cases that, that I've seen. I'm just gonna rattle off all of these names or descriptions of Kelly Lane that we've been given over the many months. I'm just gonna go for it. Is she a narcissist? No. Is she a pathological liar? Not as a diagnosis, no. Is she delusional? No. Is she evil? No. You're sure she's not mentally ill? Certainly not in a diagnostic sense, absolutely certain of that. What do you think drove Kelly to have all those pregnancies? Well, from a very early age, she got the message that um, her family didn't like dealing with negative emotions. 
they got pushed down, they got squashed. Her first sexual experience at 15, which was a date rape, um, which she blamed herself. I was quite young and I was intoxicated. How do you see it, how that date rape impacted you? I think the lack of ownership. I, I didn't value, I don't think I valued my body and, and my choices and my boundaries because everybody seemed to just be so frivolous with it. And I think for, for whatever reason, me feeling out of control, I think that all contributed to um, to, to my choices and, and falling pregnant and, and not knowing how to manage it. She certainly had empathic identification with her children. She breastfed them. She had them in her care. So this was not just get this child out of my life. So you can't see her actively murdering the child? Um, so it, it just doesn't fit. I can't find a coherent narrative from a psychological sense apart from we know she has this capacity to disown her children um, and it fits into that. Could Tegan be alive? Yes. <laughs> A jury has spent almost four months hearing evidence and submissions in this court. Soon the group will retire to consider whether Kelly Lane is guilty or not guilty of murder. In summing up the case, Justice Anthony Wheelie said, suspicion, even the gravest suspicion, is never a substitute for proof beyond reasonable doubt. On the evidence. To the jury going out to consider their verdict, I, I was uncertain what the, what the result would be. Why do you think you were uncertain? Because, uh, in my mind at least, there was this doubt about whether the Crown had effectively demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt that the baby had not survived. And I thought the jury might take a, a similar view as well. My team said, you know, we've got to trust that the jury is smart enough to see the story that the Crown's putting up, and that's all it is, is a story. Everybody kept saying to me, the longer the deliberations go, the better. Six months of trial, the worst case will be a hung jury. Quote. The jury deliberated for quite a while. Yes, it was, it was a lengthy deliberation. What's that like, that weight? Oh, it's agonising. <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> the voting was um, quite close and the jury were in conflict. The jury had indicated they'd reached a point where they could not agree. Eleven people uh, saying, yes, convict, and one person saying, well, I'm not going to. And it seemed to me that that point uh, could only be resolved by a majority verdict. Look, as a, as a Crown Prosecutor, I'm not there to achieve convictions. I'm there to see that justice is done. If we've presented the case, properly and in the best light, we've performed our role. We were really confident that the verdict would come out in her favour. There was a lot of tension in the courtroom. I was expecting not guilty, he said guilty. I just looked across and I looked back at them, I just couldn't believe it. I'm still astounded now. And then, you know, my poor, My oh, poor girl collapsed. And uh, they would let me go over. So uh, I started to walk around. They said, no, you can't. No. And unfortunately, I collapsed too. Such a shock. If you think that doesn't touch the judge, uh, you're quite wrong, it does. And it did. I was shocked that Kelly was found guilty. 
I was stunned. I honestly thought that she would be found not guilty because there had been so many problems. I believe she did, she murdered a baby and she deserved due process, however. Tonight, guilty, Kelly Lane convicted of murdering her baby daughter. How are you feeling about the sentence, Mrs Lane? How's Kelly? Have you had a chance to speak Don't to her? Touch me, please. Did the prosecution prove that that baby was dead, Tegan was uh, dead? If, if I'd been the trier of fact, and I wasn't, let me stress that, the jury were the trier of fact, but if I'd been the trier of fact, I might have had some doubt about that. In my mind, I've never been certain. Never been certain. And now? And now, years later, um, I haven't changed my attitude. Court will now adjourn. By the end of the trial, it had been such a harrowing experience for me that I no longer wished to preside over any criminal trial as a judge. I didn't do any more criminal trials after that. Well, she still haunts me. You know, it's still unsolved. Nobody has ever found Tegan. You know, I've been medically discharged with PTSD from the police, so this broke me. I, I still think about it. I still think about it. I have been to the hospital and um, where Tegan was last seen to, in my mind, lay her to rest with nobody. That's what nobody gets. It's just how many lives this has affected. We've chased down every lead we can. We've turned over every stone for months. We've gone back to her family and her boyfriends and her water polo teammates, her friends, to try and find new things and getting un get an understanding of her. We looked at the police investigation. We went through the trial. There's one little piece of information, I think, now that's nagging for both of us. And that's what that psychiatrist said. She said there's something off, there's something not quite right with her story about the name Andrew Norris Morris. When you did an assessment with her, what were the things that didn't sit right with you? What stuck out? The key thing was her manner as she discussed Andrew Norris. The Andrew Norris Morris situation was the key number one, two and three thing too superficial, um, the body language changed. There was something there that didn't ring true and um, I can't actually say what it was, what, what the truth is. I don't know about you, but I am not convinced on the name. But she's always stuck to that story since the very beginning. She's responded really badly in the past when police have tried to get her to change her story or get new information. How are you feeling, Cara? Anxious. Because this is it. And this is her last opportunity to just give something more. Because everyone agrees that the name does not add up. OK, this is it. So here we begin. Go ahead, please. Hi, hey, Cara. Hello, Kelly. So. Through all of this, you've spoken at length and I've listened very attentively. And yep. now I want to take my turn to talk for a while. Sure. OK. Do yep. We raise big questions about the police investigation, about the trial, really things that I thought we'd never find. Right. But there's another big question. And this one, it comes down to you. 
the name Andrew Morris, Andrew Norris, something isn't quite right there. So I'm saying to you, I'm not convinced on this name and I need you to help me. I need you to give me something here. Um, I don't know why I should have to. Well, I can't give you any more than what I know. And this feels like, too, the same as when I was before the coroner, and it's that pressure and those threats of, you know more, you know more. So, first name, Andrew. Yeah. Surname? Norris, with an N. She's not going to change her mind. She's not going to say anything. I have absolutely no reason to pull this all apart again. Why would I uh, pull it all apart again and bring this all to the surface again? My family's life is on the line here. You know, we're doing this for a reason. It's got a purpose. And that reason? It's to find Tegan, or it's to find my baby, whatever her name But could you give her or people out there a message that Andrew Norris may not be his right full name? Absolutely, absolutely. I don't know 100% if his name is Andrew Norris because I don't know at the time if what he was telling me was the truth or maybe I've made a mistake. Of course that's a possibility. I'm sure his name is Andrew. He responded to Andrew. OK. You've got there. OK. Yeah, I don't want to be forced there though, Caro. I did it off my own bat. Done. Well, that's the first time in decades that she's admitted that the name that she gave could be the wrong name. So, is this just another one of her lies? Or have we just gotten closer to the truth? <laughs>